morning, everyone. Uh, we would like to uh, say thank you to CMHC for uh, being the sponsor of this uh, session. And Ken Rouet from CMHC head office was to be the presenter. Um, but uh, he was unable to attend this week, so he asked Keith and I to take his place. And uh, we were very happy to do that and uh, um, put together a slideshow uh, for you that uh, talks about crawl spaces, all things crawl spaces. Um, so my name is uh, Gail Lawler and my company is uh, Energy Matters and I hail from Pickering, Ontario, born and raised, that's my home community. And uh, I've been uh, working in housing, existing housing primarily uh, for over 33 years. And uh, I've uh, been very privileged and uh, enjoyed my time working in First Nations communities. I recognize many faces here from um, about 2007. I've been uh, working in communities in the northwest of uh, um, Ontario, but uh, right now, since 2010, I've been working with uh, Fort Albany, Kashashuan, and Attawapiskat on uh, their housing uh, projects, uh, community energy planning, and because those three communities have a um, electric utility, they are um, offering all of the same conservation programs that all other electric utilities are offering to their customers, and so I'm involved in that work where we're doing home energy retrofit work. But uh, my uh, um, great interest is to make sure that we are doing foundations right, existing foundations, and offering new ideas for new foundations. So with that in mind, I'll, uh, I'm happy to be presenting this information, but I'm also hoping that in the future we'll be doing a pilot and doing some research on foundations, which uh, I can talk to anybody. If there's anyone interested in uh, discussing that afterwards, I'd love to talk to you. I've already uh, connected with Trevor over here about uh, some good work on foundations, so I would love to talk to anybody else who would like to work with me on exploring the options for foundations. And as you can see, um, the both of us were probably vaccinated with a phonograph needle because we don't know when to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Keith Merkel. Uh, I'm from the Mohawks, the Bay of Quinney. Uh, I've been in uh, First Nation housing since about uh, 1972. And uh, I now um, do a lot of training courses across Canada for CMHC from Labrador to British Columbia. So um, it's always a pleasure to see. I've been on uh, over 100 of the First Nations in Ontario. And it's always good to see uh, some older faces as, uh, as I grow old, they grow old. And the younger people that are coming up is, uh, is the ones that we need to uh, start to work with and deal with and uh, have some, uh, give some more, uh, some more information. So um, with that, uh, we'll get started. And uh, like, uh, like Gail said, we're going to, uh, we're going to talk about, uh, about crawl spaces. The old lessons, um, we all know the old lessons. We've all had bad crawl spaces. We've all had, uh, houses at rack, we've all been, uh, and the problem, I, I guess the, the interesting thing about the whole thing is you don't have to live in northern Ontario, uh, any place where you have a little bit of frost in the ground. Southern Ontario is just as bad as northern Ontario in some instance when we build, uh, we build crawl spaces and we build them wrong. So uh, mother, uh, mother Nature can uh, throw some pretty severe weather at us in southern Ontario as they do to use constantly in northern Ontario. So. We've all experienced uh, bad crawl spaces, so that's our old lesson. So from today on, we're going to start a new story. We're going to start doing it right. We need to start doing it right. And uh, we need to start saving our houses. Our, our houses have to last us more than 17 to 20 years. And it's the foundations that are causing us the problems. You know, it's, uh, it's the same old thing. You know, uh, if you don't have a good foundation, I'm, I'm 72 years old, my feet are starting to go on me. That's my foundation. I can't get around like I used to anymore. So now I'm, I'm starting to be limited. My That's house why you have friends, Keith. My house is starting to fall <laughs> apart. So anyways, uh, this, is, uh, this is the thing with, uh, with, with crawl spaces. So our agenda for the hour and a half that you're with us is uh, to talk about why do crawl spaces fail. You're going to have to do a little bit of work. We're going to be asking for your information. Um, we're all experienced in uh, failed crawl spaces, unfortunately. Then we'll spend some time on how do we retrofit those existing crawl spaces to make them work better uh, because we can't all afford to remove the um, house and rebuild new. But when we do build new and or the house is worth saving and we can lift it and build a new foundation under it, then what are some of the options for doing it differently? We've been doing the same old, same old with the same uh, response. And as Keith has said, uh, you know, that's the definition of insanity. That's right. 
keep doing the same thing and hoping for a different conclusion, and it's not working, so we really do need to make a change. One of the exciting parts of this uh, presentation, I think, is that we, in our research of what are the new foundations and crawl spaces that can work, we started talking to people who are doing that work, and uh, so we have with us, uh, at great expense, <laughs> uh, we have Tim uh, Staniszewski, Staniszewski from Multipoint Foundations, and he has a booth tomorrow at the trade show. He's going to speak about uh, their uh, product. It's a raised raft foundation. And then we have Lawrence, Brad, and Terry here, and I'll give your full names uh, later, uh, with um, the Northern S uh, Structural Screw Company, and they are going to be talking about the Crinner screw system that they have just successfully used in Fort Albany uh, this past winter. So, and, uh, and that whole product line. So we are going to have them come up on the stage and talk about their products. So I hope that you'll find that enlightening. I'd just like to point out at the table, there are many different handouts. Um, one of them is the slides. And there is also a, a piece from um, CMHC. And there's also uh, two other single page ones on deployable houses from Natural Resources Canada that uses a raised raft foundation. And there's also one that is based out of Wiki, and it is about um, turning crawl spaces into living spaces. I only put a limited number at each table, not knowing how many we'd get. I do have extras at the front, and if you didn't get a copy and you would like a copy, just come and see me at the end, and we'll make sure you get a copy of, of anything. One of the things that I'd like to point out about the handouts that, uh, that we've given you is there's a, a research headlight for, uh, headlight, uh, <laughs> highlight from... Uh, i got to go home and get my false teeth realigned. They're out of alignment here. So, uh, um, From CMHC. And uh, in there, they, they talk about using bleach. This is a 2008, an eight, uh, uh, publication. Uh, we do not use bleach on mold anymore, OK? Please don't. Don't go there, OK? Um, it's not good. Uh, it's not healthy for the people in the house. Uh, the fumes from it are, can bring on some asthma attacks pretty quickly. So you need to be very careful, and our recommendation now is do not use bleach on mold. Okay, so yeah. like I said, this, uh, this is an old publication, so uh, it, it refers to it a couple, of two or three times. At the end of it, it says that it really didn't make much difference, but we don't use bleach on, okay? Thank you very much. So the workshop uh, objectives is to identify the common problems that uh, from improper design and uh, the construction of crawl spaces to improve our understanding of how to renovate and build problem-free crawl spaces and to introduce, as we said earlier, alternate uh, crawl space and foundation designs. So crawl spaces are out of sight, out of mind. So I'm doing a workshop in, uh, in the Maritimes. I got 25 builders in the room from uh, around the First Nations, uh, Mi'kmaq First Nations in the area. And uh, the first question I asked them as we went around the table to the 25 people is, what's a foundation for? What's the purpose of a foundation? 20 of them told me it was to hold up the house. They're building some pretty nasty, pretty nasty houses if that's their interpretation of a, founda of a foundation under a house. So from that, uh, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind, so we don't, pay a, we don't pay a whole lot of attention to it. So one of the most critical components of the house, but it's hidden from view. And I've, I always say that everything starts under your feet. And we got to start to, to control that air movement that's coming into our buildings uh, right, from the, right from, the design, from the design stage of our, uh, of our foundations, whether it be crawl space or a full basement, but especially crawl spaces. Simply that they're, they're tall enough to walk in. So I mean, if we're gonna put a crawl space in and we're gonna renovate them, Let's turn it into livable space, and that's what that uh, one thing with, from Tex McLeod is about, is uh, to, to turn them in, into livable space. Uh, you raise it up, add to it, and, and away you go. But we've got to make sure that we do a proper job of the, uh, of the, of the uh, renovation. Not part of the living area. However, they host all of our uh, things, our furnaces, hot water tanks, plumbing, HRVs, and other systems in the house. And uh, one of the things that we know um, in, uh, we have, CMHC has an HRV uh, installation course and uh, maintenance course and balancing course. And uh, when I go out to do them, 99% uh, of the time, if you got a HRV in a crawl space, it's never maintained. The filters are never cleaned. People don't go into crawl spaces. 
and they haven't been installed uh, balanced either, my apologies. Um, so the HRV course, uh, we've uh, just recently done one in Albany and one in Kashashawan. And I would encourage all of your other communities that are here represented that uh, you speak to your CMHC uh, consultant and get an HRV uh, course uh, done in your community and teach the people who uh, are on your housing staff how to balance them and how to maintain them and to teach your community members how to maintain them because they are an integral part of keeping our houses healthy. They're either conditioned or unconditioned. Uh, both can work if designed and operated properly, but there, there has to be considerations done. Unconditioned uh, versus conditioned. Uh, crawl spaces are either unconditioned or conditioned. Both work well. The current research and practice uh, experience has demonstrated that the conditioned crawl space outperforms the unconditioned one for durability and energy efficiency. So, you know, when we do a conditioned one, we basically got uh, heat down there. We've got some uh, uh, some uh, type of ground control, uh, moisture control into it, and stuff like that. So, unconditioned crawl space, uh, as you as you can see here, uh, you know, we have the insulation is all in the floor, and uh, we have a barrier there, and then we have crawl space vents into it. Over the years, in the 80s, the building code confused us. Uh, in the 85, 85, 90 building code, confused, uh, confu everybody got confused with the fact that everybody thought regardless of what you put in, you had to ventilate it. And that's where we started getting into a lot of, uh, a lot of problems when, when we started treating them. So this is a conditioned one, and as you can see there, we've now got the, the insulations on the walls and just the header areas, we've taken the insulation out of the floor joists. But a lot of the times, we, we didn't do the floors properly. We didn't seal off the, with, with the proper things. And a lot of them, some of them, we didn't even insulate the, the, those walls uh, in the crawl space. Why do they fail? Well, we have uh, four ways. And I would like you to take a minute to, uh, um, at your table and just discuss from what you know from your crawl spaces Think of one issue under each of those four categories. We know that there's structural issues with crawl spaces and what are the consequences of that structural issue. Moisture related, that's the moisture coming up um, in vapor form through the ground. Water related, that's water that actually will seep into the crawl space from outside um, or it could be a plumbing leak. And then of course the comfort related issues. So take just a minute, I want you to talk. I want to hear a buzz in the room. It's not about us being up here telling you everything. You are already very aware of this. And let's write down some of these ideas and see where we're at. So take one minute and discuss and come up with one issue that you're aware of under each of those uh, categories. Okay, are we ready to uh, list off uh, some of the issues when we have a structure-related problem with a crawl space? We've got frost heave or movement. Can anybody shout out one? What are some of the issues with structure-related? Pardon? Pardon? Just shout it out, sorry. No? Yes, heaving of the walls. Thank you. Anything else? That's the walls of the crawl space and the walls of the house as well. Cracks. And the cracking would be done on your cement block that you have built up 
That's right. Oop, my flip chart just started to slide down. I hope it's not going to collapse on us. Anybody else? What are some other issues related to structure? Uh, oops. Thank you. Anything else? Pardon? Okay. So the structural uh, beams and uh, and and um, is that you said the structural beams and the uh, joist. Sorry. Moving and cracking. Anything else? Pardon? Rot, Rot uh, from structure uh, change. Okay, do you want to explain that? Uh, moisture. Okay. Okay. I, so the water, so water will come in through those cracks. I'm going to put that under here. So uh, cracks allow. H2O penetration or uh, into the space, okay? Okay, so let's see what we've got on our slide here. What else we got? Shifting. So it's a shifting, so absolutely. Uh, the heaving of the wall, shifting. Heaving and cracking, inadequate bearing of uh, the system, structural cracking we got. The drywall and doors and windows binding. Um, trying to weather strip doors and windows, and if the uh, house is shifting, uh, we can't close the, the doors in uh, certain seasons. And the settlement of the entire house into the ground. So the entire house, has anybody seen any of these houses? <laughs> Just a few, eh? <laughs> so let's look at a couple of pictures of what that looks like. <laughs> Sorry, the story. Keith said to me, where did you get that picture from? He took this picture how long ago? Oh, in the uh, early 80s in uh, <laughs> Long Lack uh, 77. So it proves to always be careful where you take your pictures and where they end up, because you never know when they're going to come back around full circle. There's a, an open vent as well with that crawl space. And you can see the, uh, in the middle the uh, support beams. I think that would go back to this gentleman's uh, comment. So, some moisture related. Uh, so, the moisture, uh, what are some of the issues with the moisture related? Mold, absolutely. What else? Anybody there? Wood rot. Wood rot, thank you. We've got rot happening, mold, rot. Anything else? No. Smell. Does anybody know why mold smells? It's to tell other molds. I've already got this wet spot. This is my place where I'm going to set up camp, and you go and find another wet spot. That is why mold smells. We think it's just for us so that we know whether we have mold or not. But in fact, they are living, breathing organisms, and so it's a defense mechanism for them to be able to tell other molds, I'm already here, go find another place to, to grow. So let's see what else we've got on here. Mold growth in the crawl space, absolutely. Wood rot, we've got that one. And that moisture all comes up into the house as well. And the smells we've got. No one's looking ahead on their sheets out there, are you? Getting the answers of the uh, <laughs> handout. So we've got uh, the mold and moisture problems inside the crawl space. And that is a chipboard. Uh, um, that's a very typical installation. We've got the walls insulated, but we've also insulated the, uh, the floor of the main floor, and then we've put a very uh, moisture-loving uh, uh, particle board to hold the insulation up, and it's absorbed all the moisture and allowing food. To, uh, it's just providing great food for mold. It's uh, like pablum for mold. I love this one of mushrooms growing. This was a friend of mine, Tony Woods, who took this picture, and he said uh, he knew that the crawl space was pretty wet when his knife slid into the joist. I love that shot. And this is a crawl space that actually had plumbing issues as well. And so uh, the crawl space did have plastic on the floor. This was in less than two years, all of this uh, damage. The plumber went down to fix some plumbing and messed up all the poly on the floor, but didn't fix the plumbing completely. And the amount of moisture in that uh, crawl space uh, resulted in that's the best picture of mold I've got. And then that moisture all comes up into the house through stack effect, carrying all that uh, warm air, because warm air rises. Warm air has a lot of ability to hold moisture, and it comes up into our uh, homes. 
And on cold corners, it can condense. And as you can see, where the dark is, there's mold growing and there's actually ice. Uh, when I took that picture, the uh, comforter was in the clothes closet. And when I pulled it away, you could see where the ice was formed all around it. So uh, very cold. Now, to be fair, that was a closet that projected outside of the envelope of the house. And so it had three exposed surfaces projecting out of the house and no heat source to it and a door that was closed and full of uh, clothes. So it had no heat, lots of moisture. The crawl space was a mess in this house. I'll let you talk about wet feet. So this is, uh, if your house has wet feet, it may have a wet attic too. So this is the underside of the uh, trusses, uh, the underside of the roof sheathing. Um, it's moved up through the house through stack effect. And uh, a lot of it is uh, when, the, when the moisture, when you got moisture in the bottom, uh, it moves up. Uh, we have a misconception of the fact that we think that heat rises. Well, heat doesn't rise. Uh, it dissipates in all directions. Hot goes to cold. So we end up with, uh, when, uh, when we warm the, the cold air in, when it comes up, we lighten it up. As it moves up through our house, it takes three things with it. It takes heat, it takes moisture, and it takes odors up through the house with us. So, and again, I go back to the statement that everything happens under our feet. So if we walk into a house and, and that you shove the attic hatch up and you shine the light on the underside of the sheathing, if you've got the like of that there, you've got some problems going on under your feet that you need to control. Many times we look at a, sorry. No, Many times we look at a problem like that and we think the attic needs more what? Ventilation. In fact, what we need to be doing is air sealing the attic floor so that the moisture can't get up into a cold space and allow it to condense. So our third uh, uh, issue with why crawl spaces fail is uh, water. So what are some of the issues around water? What have you got uh, here from another table somewhere? Raining. Pardon, raining? Grading. grading, thank you. So negative grading, where the ground slopes back to the house from settling, or you've got uh, also issues where downspouts are pouring water and it degrades the grading. So negative grading around, excellent. What else? I just mentioned one. The weeping tiles may be uh, broken or clogged. OK, absolutely. So, uh, so the drainage may be uh, inadequ inadequate. What did I hear over here? Did I hear downspouts? Thank you. Downspouts are disconnected. We've all seen that one. Okay, let's see what we got. So water leakage into the crawl space. So rain, uh, water, flooding, all coming into the crawl space because of uh, inadequate uh, um, uh, positive uh, grading around. And we missed that one, the dirt floor. How many times have we built our homes with a dirt floor? And so that dirt floor, if it's not covered or not inadequately covered with poly, allowing all that moisture to come up through, Standing water could be from leakage, and it could also be from what else? Where can the standing water on top of a poly come from? Plumbing. Plumbing leaks, absolutely. Uh, overflows of washing machines, things like that. Just a few pictures, nothing that we haven't already all seen. That one's got water all over, pockets of water everywhere there. One of, one of the issues that we have when we put poly down we put the poly down to stop the movement of that moisture coming up through the ground. But if we have leaks in the thing and everything, then w when we get a situation, when you get a situation like this one here, um, with, with all the water laying on top, it's got no place to go but up through the house now. As it dries out, it dries out uh, up through the house and it saturates the house on, uh, on the inside. So, you know, it, it's a, it, it's, it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Uh, if you don't put it down, you're gonna get this. If you put it down and you have a leak and you don't control what's in there, then you've made it worse because now you've captured it and it's got no place to go but into the building and uh, as it goes through. So so this one here, um, this effervescence on the thing. That's there's, their question. Hmm? That's their question. What are the white marks? Oh. <laughs> he just gave you the answer. I can't give out a prize now. <laughs> prize is going to be her pushing me off the podium here. So. <laughs> no. um, anyways, 
that's a thing. So what's happened, block walls are bad. Uh, when, when we pour block walls, you can have a leak in a block wall over there and it'll come out over on this side here because it goes through the, the holes in the center of the blocks and stuff and it's very hard to pinpoint a, a leak in a block wall uh, when you're doing it. And, uh, and, and again, uh, on this one here, they got a bunch of uh, things and pretty nasty uh, insulation up in the uh, up in, the, in this area here. So whenever we see those white marks and it's uh, like a crystallized um, mineral material on the block, that's a really good clue to you that you've got moisture traveling through the uh, concrete wall. Many times we think that that white efflorescence is mold, but it's not. It's the minerals being left behind as the water drains or dries into the uh, uh, space. So a good indicator. So what are some comfort related uh, issues? How do we know that our crawl spaces are failing? What kind of comfort issues do we hear? Yes? Cold floors. Absolutely. Cold floors. What else? The house is shifting and we've got cracks. What do we get? Drafts. Thank you. So no longer, even if we uh, built that house to be airtight, if it has uh, an unstable uh, foundation and it's uh, shifting, we'll get cracks and leaks and we'll get drafts around doors, windows, and around baseboards. Anything else that you've heard people complain about when the crawl space fails? Insects, yes, animals and insects getting into that space. Absolutely. From an odor problem, from a health issue. Absolutely. So let's see what we've got on this list. And so freezing of water and sewage lines. So the, the, uh, the, the problem of uh, someone complaining that their uh, plumbing has frozen. And of course, you've got the burst water from that, but it's also the inconvenience of that. And the open vents cool down that whole space. And the lack of heating in that area as well, too. So one of the things you're going to uh, hear us say over and over again in this, in this talk is that, as, as Keith said, it's damned if you, damned if you don't. Do we heat it? and condition it and close off the vents? Do we leave the vents open and allow it to be vented? Do we make it part of the house? Is it a short basement? Or is it completely outside the building envelope of the house? These are decisions that we've been grappling with as a, a building industry for quite a long time. And we think we've got it to the right spot, but there's still some issues to be resolved, which will come out as we continue talking. So this is one of the issues that we have. Uh, in the, between the 80 and 85 building code, uh, it said that uh, crawl spaces had to, be, uh, had to be vented in there. And there wasn't really a distinction between, between conditioned and unconditioned. So we ended up doing this. We ended up putting foam, uh, very expensive foams on the, on the walls to seal them up and everything. And then we turned around and poked eight holes in it. How smart's that? And that's where we sit today. We got a lot of them out there that have got, uh, you know, good good foam on the on the walls and the header areas are done pretty decent. But we got eight holes in it, so uh, you know, what's it's it's ridiculous. So we open them. We're supposed to close them in the in the winter time and open them in the summertime. Well, that's it's murder, because where's the coolest spot in the summertime, in your crawl space? Where's all the heat and humidity? Outside, which way does heat go? Do you think the, temp the do you think the air from your crawl space is going out those vents? Think again. Hot goes to cold, so it's all coming in to those crawl spaces. We can probably we're probably growing as much mold and mildew in the summertime as we do in the wintertime. So I mean, it again, you know, we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. So we got to get rid of them. We got to take them out of there, and we've got to uh, condition these these spaces if we're, if we're going to keep them. So why do these problems occur? There's all sorts of uh, good reasons. And one of the main ones is, what are we building in? And uh, I know in the James Bay Lowland, we're building in Muskeg. There is uh, good solid uh, soil uh, about uh, 8 to 10 feet uh, down. There's a good clay base. But uh, if we're building in that top 6 to 8 feet, we're building in very unsettled soils. There's lots of other. Uh, examples of uh, soil problems. And there's a whole class and course we could take just on identifying the soils uh, and making decisions. So we've got some frost-related problems, heaving, add freezing, and stuff like that. When you get a lot of moisture in a, 
in, in the muskeg and everything and she freezes deep, then she, she will take a hold of a, of a pylon or anything that we've put into it and it'll just shove it up. It'll just lift it up. Add freezing, get a hold of it, and, and, and move it upward. So we have a big problem with that also. Construction on high water tables. Uh, how many people are building in a high water table area or in uh, Muskeg as well? Put your hands up. How many have we got that are building in high water levels? Pascal, put your hand up. <laughs> Quite a few, that's right. So we do have a lot of our, our northern, now many times we're building on rock and in other places we're building on sand and so we don't have the same issues but uh, high water tables, knowing what you're building in is, is, uh, is an important step uh, before construction. Poor design, poor construction, uh, poor quality control. So the design is very important. We, we can't use uh, one design in, in uh, we may need a couple of different designs per community, but we can't use the same design from community to community, and that's what we've been doing. Crawl spaces have been, we've just been moving that design around the, around the countryside, north to south, east to west. You know, and it's, uh, in, in some places it works, some places it doesn't work. So we've got to start. I took a uh, project management course one time years ago when I was, uh, well, four or five years ago when I was in my 20s. And uh, <laughs> what the first thing that the guy said to us was, you know, um, the house is 80% built before you, before you dig the hole for the foundation. So you put all of that work up front. He said building the house is only the menial part of it. But we don't put that 80% in in most cases. And that's, uh, that's what we've got to start doing. We've got to start having stuff designed to our, to our communities. Once we know what fits our community and what works in our community, now we can move forward. And we can start building houses that last, and we can start building good communities for our people. So we all know that uh, you know, if you can build uh, three houses for, the, um, for a set amount of money, um, it's going to be hard if, if we say, well, we have to spend a bit more money on each house. We're only going to get two and a half houses out of the budget. It's easy just to go back to what uh, is the standard and, and let's just build the three houses. And all of our issues with uh, long waiting lists for housing is an issue. But there's a point where we have to stop building the same way and creating the problems because, as Keith said at the beginning, the houses aren't lasting long enough. And when you invest, let's say, $200,000 into a home, and it doesn't last more than 20 years, that's a poor investment of your funding. Roxanne Harper will be speaking again on Thursday, as she has at many times in this conference, about housing policy. How do we build and um, treat our houses like a business so that we are going to it, construct them properly so that they last 40, 50, 60, 70 years? That's a good investment of our $200,000. So that comes down to housing policies, um, having housing authorities, all of those good things. And I encourage you, if you haven't heard Roxanne speak, uh, to make sure you attend her session on Thursday. And I know that many communities have already uh, started down that path, and that's where budget constraints can get resolved. We might be have to look for other ways. Or, and then things are coming down in price. As we do things better, uh, things will come down in price as we all make changes to the way that we build. Um, Gail wasn't in to hear your local MP tell you that uh Things are going to be brighter with uh, money. I heard that. So. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that. And lack of, uh, of occupancy uh, operating knowledge. One of the things that we do is we don't get enough information to our people that are living in the houses on how to look after them, how to maintain them, what to look for if something starts to happen. Like, you know, don't wait till the front door falls off its hinges before you call and say there's something needs to be done here. Uh, you know, the, a lot of that, uh, a lot of that stuff. Uh, we need to start getting the uh, the occupants more involved in it. Uh, we need to start getting them involved in the design and everything. Don't build a house and say, "There, go take it. It's yours. Do what you want with it." You know, we. Uh, you can go down to the hardware store down here and buy a a, a seven dollar calculator from China, and it's got a little piece of paper in there on, on instructions on how to operate it in nine different languages. You know, um, we give somebody a two hundred and fifty, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar house, and uh, we don't we give them no information on how to live in that house whatsoever. So you know, that's one of the things that we've got to start uh, we've got to start doing too is uh, you know is getting the information to our uh, 
to, to, the, to our people that live in our houses. So we mentioned stack effect a few times in the previous slides, and uh, here's just a diagram of it. Uh, as we uh, already heard that uh, warm air rises, heat flows in any direction from hot to cold, up, down, sideways, wherever it wants to go, but warm air uh, rises. And so the moment we get a temperature difference in the winter of outside to inside temperature, 20 degrees Celsius inside the home, about minus 20 outside, the warm air starts to rise inside the home, and that, uh, because it rises up and leaves a vacuum behind, there needs, Mother Nature says, I need to pull air in from outside. So this is a very strong natural ventilation in our homes. When homes have lots of air leakage, there's lots of stack effect. When homes are more air sealed and more airtight, stack effect is reduced significantly. But as you can see, the, uh, the, the basement in this particular picture, it's part of the infiltrating, and then it moves, it, as it, that air heats, it comes up and moves into the main area, bringing the moisture and the smells and the uh, um, uh, heat from the uh, crawl space into the house, and so that's how we're moving moisture into our homes. So an airtight building structure is essential, but it's almost impossible to do if we've got frost heave happening, and the crawl space or basement is shifting and moving winter to spring, summer, and so it will always crack, and there will always be drafts, there will always be a way for that infiltration to occur. We're not saying that we want to be completely airtight and live in a bubble or in a submarine, what do we install in our homes to make sure that that house has breathability? What are the lungs called of the house that we're installing in many air homes? HRVs, heat recovery ventilators. And as Keith said, it's uh, important that operating knowledge and under people understanding the value of that HRV operating in their home to be the lungs of their house as we do work to make that home energy efficient we also have to make it, first and foremost, healthy and safe and uh, have ventilation. One of the big things that people that uh, our, our, our people don't understand about the HRVs when we put them into the buildings is it helps the building control the moisture, but it's for their health. It's for the people's health that are in there. It's for the, so that they get good indoor air quality. They have good air to breathe. They have fresh air to breathe and stuff like that. I've went into communities where they've had them shut off you go and talk to them, and after I get time to talk to them, they, they didn't know that. They thought that it was just running their hydro bill up. That's all it was doing. And 90% of the time, the, the HRVs that I look at that's been installed, that's exactly what's happening because nobody balances them when they put them in. And I talk to contractors all the time, and they say to me, oh, uh, I buy the kind that are already pre-balanced. Well, yeah, they're all balanced when you get them, but you put one elbow on them, and it's gone. You got to rebalance it again. It's airflow. You balance the airflows. So yeah, the people are complaining their hydro bill went up. Probably so because it's either sucking all the heat out of their house or it's blowing cold air back in that they got to heat up. So yeah, their hydro bill does go up. Their heating bill does go up if the HRV is not installed and balanced properly. That's the big issue with them. And remember, CMHC has that course, and it would be good for every community to have it uh, again. And, and we have a number of people in the room that. That teach that, that that teach that course uh, for for CMHC and uh, Derek does it all around the coast and everything uh, James Bay Coast and everything Tom does it S Severio does it uh, all of these guys there's a, there's a pile of them around here that that install these uh, and and do it so you can talk to them about the uh, what what uh, what you need to do to look after them. How many CMHC consultants do we have in the room? Are there some of the CMHC consultants here? There's one? Just one? You're going to get bombarded. <laughs> Talk to your CMHC uh, representative uh, about getting that course uh, in your community. So we've said over and over and over and over again, we can't have wet feet. When we have wet feet, we're uncomfortable. When our house has wet feet, the house is uncomfortable. And uh, we need to be always focused on drain, 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 drain the water away. Everything needs to be focused about that draining. And so uh, um, everything that we uh, work on um, in the house has to be how do we flow that water away so that we keep it from coming inside. So why do they fail? Because we thought that ventilating with outside air was the only way to resolve moisture problems. And so many crawl spaces do not have a covered crawl space floor of poly to stop the moisture migration up from the ground. 
And so relying on letting that moisture get in first and then relying on the open vents to be the, the only mechanism to get that moisture out has failed. We know emphatically that does not work. We can make vented crawl spaces work, but we have to stop the moisture from coming up into that space in the first place. But if we're doing that, then we might want to consider other ways to uh, control the uh, ventilation air. And that's the key word in this whole thing. We've got to learn how to control this stuff. And we're not going to stop it. It's mother, it's mother Nature. It's Mother Earth. All we need to start doing is coming up with mechanisms on how we can control that air movement in, uh, in, as it comes into our buildings and control it once it gets into our buildings. That's the big thing. And, and again, I go back to, and, and I always go back to the fact that everything happens under our feet. We can control it down there. We can have a better living space for our community people to live into. Yes, yes, that's the big, and that's where you control that, that air movement. That anything you do has got to be connected together. And the easiest way to connect it together, and as my friend Derek would say, spray foam it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the current practice uh, is this. Uh, schematic of typical with uh, thing. Not recommended, high moisture, ventilation problems, comfort problems, cold floors, frost. So that's, uh, that's, that's something that's out. A new practice that we should be looking at, the research indicates that the crawl spaces must be, be treated like a short basement. No vents to the outside. Insulate the walls, not the ceilings. Seal, air seal the headers. Cover the floors with heavy plastic and seal all edges. Provide some heat. Connect the crawl space to the house through heating ducts, HRV ducts, and create an exchange for the conditioned air and get, uh, can provide a greater improved uh, moisture control and significant energy savings when we, when we in install them properly. I think, I think we're done. There you go. There's the, all the answers. We can just <laughs> walk out the door now <laughs> with the coffee. <laughs> so why have the change come about? Because uh, environmental health officers are called in constantly uh, by um, our community members saying, we've got mold in the house. Where's that mold coming from? And I just uh, uh, had a great course in December with CMHC and all the environmental health officers who visit your communities uh, for all of Ontario. And they said, we had no idea, really, that the wetness in the crawl space was related to the mold that we're being called in to speak to the homeowners about. So connecting the dots of all of that work that they're doing to, and when I told them, there's CMHC consultants, there's uh, community energy plans going on, there's a new way of uh, looking at crawl spaces. When you go to speak to chief and council, you can't just say, there's mold, we need to remediate it. We have to get rid of the moisture problem in the first place. And they weren't aware, so CMHC put on a course for the, all the environmental health officers for Ontario to teach them building science, to teach them about wet crawl spaces and how they can be resolved and how they can be fixed and what all the impacts are. So it's because of that legal action that we've really been driving the industry. And so it's important, as we've said over and over again, health and safety is uh, the ultimate. So our goal with housing, it's always, first and foremost, health and safety. We might always think that people want to uh, talk about energy efficiency, but energy efficiency is a nice natural outcome when we deal with the health and safety of our people first. The home has to be durable so that it lasts longer than 17, 20 years. And if it's durable, it won't be wet, it won't be moldy. So we've dealt with the health and safety. And we want people to be comfortable in their homes. It's cold in Northern Ontario. At minus 40, there is no reason why people should be cold in their homes. We have the technology, we know how to build to be comfortable. And when you take care of those first four, the energy efficiency of the home is taken care of naturally. And the current way we do crawl spaces does not meet these goals. So I'm going to suggest we slip over this slide a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of detail here. You've got it on your slides because we're running a little short on time. And Keith has spoken to all of those things. So I just want you to take a minute. What are you doing right now for existing crawl spaces to retrofit them? Just talk for one minute at your table. 
What things are you doing in your community to retrofit existing crawl spaces to make them healthier, safer, more durable, and energy efficient? Slab on grade is the third section, so we still have quite a few slides here. All of the moisture management stuff, all the perimeter foundation stuff. So we've talked a lot to it, but we've yeah. really got to slide through those fast. Okay. okay, so there's where we are right here. Yeah. Um, so okay. we need to um, fly through those. We've talked a lot about them, so it's yeah. more just reinforcing. Okay. okay, can you give me an idea? What is, what's something someone's doing in their community? Yes, at the back, in the middle. In the red shirt. <laughs> I can't hear you, what? Okay, we sealed, sealed the vents. Sealed or closed off vents. What else are we doing? Adding heat. And we're sending out reminders to people to turn that baseboard off, because it's not on the thermostat sometimes. Uh, in the uh, spring, summer, fall, and turning it back on again. What else are we doing to make uh, crawl spaces work? Mm. Pardon? Poly. Adding poly. And it's not just adding the poly. What do we have to do to the poly? It has to be sealed, all edges. It has to be a bathtub. You are making a bathtub with that poly. Um, so it has to be 100% airtight. Foaming. So we're adding insulation. And to make Derek happy, we'll say it's foam. And the headers are a great place to use that foam product and, uh, and then uh, foam on the walls. What else? Anything else? Drainage. Yes, we're improving the, improving the drainage. OK, so let's see if we got everything on the slide here. Permanently closed events uh, provide positive grading, uh, uh, provide drainage for the downspouts, stop the moisture uh -huh. from the ground, cover it with heavy plastic, seal it with cuticle caulking and duct tape, move the insulation to the walls, uh, air seal the headers, provide heat through ductwork or baseboard heater, provide circulation of air connected to the conditioned space of the house through furnace or HRV, and install sufficient perimeter insulation for frost protection. Excellent list, guys. Just two that we weren't missing, that we were missing. Okay, so our next, we're going into the next section of our presentation of uh, how do we improve uh, crawl spaces. Yeah. So yes. Just one more thing. You showed a picture of the, the poly on the ground that, where the water was trapped on top of it. Yes. In some instances, you, you showed them a sump pit. Thank you. So Derek is saying that a sump pump is a great addition to uh, that list as well. Thank you, Derek, um, to pump out the water. So we have thermal efficiency. We can, you can see we're insulating on the, uh, the walls. And uh, best is to go under the slab if that's possible, but uh, that's not being done very often. And we are managing uh, the air tightness with uh, foam and uh, caulking and moisture protection and putting a, a moisture barrier on the ground and ensuring that we are then ventilating. So we have a couple of slides uh, showing some of that. And we have a few slides uh, just detailing more. Uh, the continuous uh, moisture retarder, sealing all the seams, and stopping moisture for, uh, during the construction, and creating and maintaining, as this uh, woman said earlier, that external positive sloping grade to keep the moisture that comes from rain away. This is, um, I'm not sure this is Keshachuan or Fort Albany, I'm not sure. Uh, some guys installing uh, the moisture barrier. And there's some tuck tape and acoustical all the way around, making it a bathtub. Has anybody used the 20 mil poly, um, the very, very heavy duty poly? Clean Space is a company that uh, does this installation. Uh, Keith and I have been involved on Manitoulin Island where we uh, <clears throat> demonstrated this product. Um, it's a very durable um, product to install. 
difficult to buy that product on your own, but it, uh, you can see that it makes a complete sealed uh, bathtub. And then adding a rubber mat is a great way to be able to provide access. So sometimes we've been putting <clears throat> a sand granular, a small granular uh, layer to protect the plastic. Well, in fact, if that sand gets wet, it's very difficult for it to dry out. It's far better to use a rubber mat over 6 mil poly or a rubber mat over whatever thickness of poly to make sure that we have a place to uh, easily access. So we, we've talked about this, the gutters, uh, capillary breaks at the top of the footers, footings, uh, install footing drainage systems to prevent uh, groundwater. And if there's a repeated flooding due to high water, build the house on uh, higher grade uh, gravel beds. And as Derek said, we need to make sure that we've got some pits into uh, houses that are prone to flooding. So we extend uh, the downspouts away from the building, uh, four to six feet uh, if we can. Uh, thermal efficiency, install, uh, insulate the walls from the inside or the outside, leave the ceiling and floor uninsulated, put some heat in and provide some frost protection. So in, uh, in this one here, they've, uh, they've done a pretty decent sealing job uh, around here and everything. Uh, Derek, quick question for you. Um, could you spray foam that floor? Sure. Yeah? OK. For a price. Yeah. <laughs> it's expensive. It's a lot of foam. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, OK. Right. Yeah. OK. Good. So you can see the wall is insulated. The uh, floor is not. Cool. <clears throat> so this is a slide that shows the benefit of perimeter insulation um, for frost protection. So on the left, there's no perimeter uh, frost protection. And you can see the line where the frozen line is. And so <clears throat> our level of frost penetration is uh, quite deep and directly below the house. On the right side, there's two arrows pointing down to the perimeter um, extruded polystyrene that's been added around that house. And you can see the difference of how it shifts the frost penetration away from the footings. So the benefit of frost protection around the footings of the house is huge, and it's an important part. Unfortunately, if it's not deep enough under the soil, I have discovered that kids like to pick at that. <laughs> they, they'll dig down and they find the blue styrofoam and they like to, it's like a prize. Uh, so we have to uh, have it down and well uh, covered up. So when we, do the, uh, when we do the exterior insulation levels, there's a chart that we do and we do it by degree days. So we've got uh, less than 3,800 degree days. You need it out 24, 24 inches R10. And if you got 30, 38 to 6,000, you do uh, four feet. And if you have over 6,000, uh, 6, then you do uh, two, two, and one inch there. So that's the kind of the, the chart that's, and that's in uh, a bunch of the CMHC uh, uh, presentations that we have and stuff like that on, on how to do that. Uh, and this is basically what you do. You layer down there like that. You always want to take, and one of the things that I find when people do uh, exterior uh, uh, frost protection is they don't slope it away from the building. Because remember, any water that gets on it is going to run. And if they slope it into the building, then the water gets in there, lays there, and freezes. It doesn't really do much good. So you always have to make sure that it's sloped away from, away from the building uh, a little bit, uh, just so that the water that gets on top of it will, will get away from it. So when we do, uh, this is a preserved wood foundation. And this here, all told here, this is about 16 inches uh, up in this. And there again, there's that. Uh, Things to protect uh, to protect this from uh, from moving up. So you basically could take this, go out in the parking lot out here, build that up, and go or go in the in the lawn out there, build this up, scrape the organics off, build this up, put about 16 inches out around it with your frost protection, and never move. Mother Earth has only got uh, one uh, R1 per foot, so that's uh, that's the reason why the majority of the place you got to be four and five feet in the ground. Our uh, one inch of foam is our five. So let's not go down to meet Mother Nature. Bring Mother Nature up to us. About the simplest way of, uh, of putting it. So frost protected uh, shallow foundations. And again, there, this is, uh, this is one that's uh, 
No, not very deep. I, I don't know the, the depth on that. Well, 16 inches. Yeah. And then uh, the foam out there, and as you can see, it's it sloped uh, it sloped pretty good there to uh, to get the water away from the away from the bill. And there's another picture of the same thing. This is uh, this is up in northern Kenora, someplace uh, where they were uh, where they were doing this. Uh, First Nation up above Kenora. And there's another one where they've uh, they've done. They're, they're doing the same, the same thing on there. So, so sealed heated crawl space, the advantages is it's, uh, yes, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, no additional cost insulation from floor system is moved to the walls uh, in the other style. Plumbing and air supply heat can be installed in the crawl space without concerns of freezing. And the floor temperature will be more comfortable. Uh, humidity conditions in the crawl space can be controlled and the potential for mold growth minimized so we can control the, uh, the humidity in the, in the crawl spaces. Uh, prevent warm summer air from entering the crawl space and becoming a source of moisture. Cautions about unvented ones, uh, just like basement slabs, windows and roof flashings, foundation waterproofing or plumbing, an unvented crawl space that is installed improperly can be more harm than good. You must find a way to circulate the air between the house and the crawl space, either through ductwork or a small exhaust fan, and control an exhaust fan with a dehumidistat so it operates only when the moisture level reaches a set percentage. And that would probably be around 35% is when you'd want to uh, set that humidistat so that that fan comes on. Yep? Are you suggesting that you ventilate that outside or into the... Outside. 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 Uh, conditioning the crawl space, uh, treat the same way as any other space in the house. It's a, it's a short room in the house. Your crawl space, you have to treat it the same as a, sh it's a, it's a short room in the house. Air must be supplied to the crawl space from the house. Um, air can be returned back to the house or it can be exhausted. So uh, ideally, again, this is the temperatures year round. Uh, must be kept clean as, a uh, as the living space and ensure no access uh, for animals. So uh, the design, when properly designed, constructed, and maintained, any of the uh, identified crawl space options can be constructed to result in no problems. Likewise, all can provide poor results when not properly constructed. So, Structurally sound, uh, can transfer loads from the building to the bearing soil and resist uh, soil movement. Uh, leak proof, can resist water leakage, dry, resist flow of Soil vapors and airtight resist flow of cold air in and heat out through uh, through any of the cracks. Thermal efficiency resists uh, loss of uh, heat flow. And uh, conditioned air, tempered and, and exchange of uh, air control. So does that sound like something we can all achieve? It sounds simple and easy, but it is difficult to conduct in the, in the field and, uh, and make sure that that's happening. And to get to those... Uh, um, to be able to ensure that we have all of those features, we have to understand the soil conditions that we're working in. Not, as Keith said earlier, it's not every unit can be built in every location. We do have to have uh, an understanding of soil conditions. And we have to uh, select the right system, the right foundation system for that uh, condition. We have to uh, develop better details and make sure that our uh, contractors are using those uh, details that work for our area and watch the work that's being done and making sure that it is being done effectively. Educate our uh, um, occupants on how to maintain the crawl space and coming back to housing policy. If we put all of those details that we've worked so hard at these conferences and, uh, and in our other efforts to uh, make sure that we're doing things right, get it put in policy so that it uh, bridges from ch um, chief and council to the next chief and council and those policies help to guide us uh, through the years. And consider a different way. Let's not, we've focused mostly on this presentation on how to deal with our existing crawl spaces, but our next part is to talk about there are better and new ways. Some of them are around for 50 years, but we haven't been exposed to them. So we have four options that we'd like to share with you. Keith is gonna do the first two, and then um, our other guest speakers are gonna come up and do three and four. So in Wiki, they are successfully converting crawl spaces into living spaces by building up. And we're also looking at slab on grade, which was done in Tyendinaga. 
The third one is the Raised Raft Foundation, which uh, Tim will come up and speak to, and installing a piled foundation screw system, which we'll have Lawrence, Terry, and Brad come up and speak to. So the converting the crawl space to living space, they just took the, they just took the houses and they jacked them up in the air. They took the crawl spaces out of them that was in them. They put new ICF crawl spaces or under them. They extended them up four more feet. Now they've got uh, now they've got a story and a half, basically a split en split entrance house, uh, which they did. And Wiki's been doing this successfully for quite some time now. So this is uh, what they look at. Uh, they had a house builder come in back a number of years ago, and Walter Mishabinjima was there, and uh, taught them how to pick up these houses. So they lift these houses up. Uh, they shove the old uh, uh, foundations out from under, uh, crawl spaces out from under them. They put the uh, they put ICFs under them, and in some cases, if they want them raised up, they put a full one onto them, and then they uh, they lower them back down. And uh, now, now that house, because it's got a good foundation underneath it, and the moisture is control that's coming into the building, now that house can apply for wrap or for for wrap or uh, a housing loan to fix up the rest of it. So that was their where they started at. So this is one here that's before, and this is what they done to it after. They, they, turned that, they turned that whole bottom end into living space. This is the entrance way, and the stairs is in there because the house was so small that there wasn't enough room to get the split to go up and down. So they, they built, and it, this becomes the mud room. Their theory was, if we're gonna spend all this money retrofitting the crawl space, why don't we just make it four feet higher and make it into living space? So it's now built on grade, not in the ground, and they've uh, put a whole new floor into the, uh, into the house. There is a handout at all of the tables um, that talks to this uh, project um, and uh, addressing the housing problems that we're all quite aware of, shortage, affordability, and durability. And if you didn't get if a copy, because there's not enough left, I do have extras here, and we can get more as well. And Texas uh, contact information is on that uh, handout too. So a slab on grade uh, is, is one of the alternatives that we look at. Uh, I work with a gentleman out of the uh, East Coast who is a traditionalist, and he said if the creator would have wanted us to live in the ground, he'd have left us in caves. So, uh, and his theory is uh, our First Nation people never ever, we, we never, never even buried our people in the ground. We laid them on the ground, covered them with rocks, or we, we covered them with earth, or we put them up in the air. So he says that, uh, you know, we're, what, what are we doing living in the ground? So uh, let's do some slab on grade. So this is a project at my own First Nation that was done a number of years ago. This was probably the first one that I ever seen uh, done at First Na at, on a First Nation uh, slab on grade. Uh, there they are there with the uh, Italian helicopter finishing her off the top there. So, But uh, one of the things that happened with this first round project was uh, they, they never brought the insulation all the way out and you got two of the hottest pipes there. I supply propane to these buildings now and they're very, hard to, they're very high energy. What happens is the theory behind it was that the, the warm air would go out and uh, keep the, the frost from heaving the, the wall even though they put, uh, the, the, they put uh, the, the insulation out there. So anyways, they ended up uh, things. So this has now been changed. Uh, this insulation goes all the way, goes all the way over there now and, and does, uh, but this, like I said, that, that was the first kick at the cat that they did and it, uh, it, needed, uh, it needed some uh, thing. But the houses work very well. They're very energy efficient and everything other than they're a bit high on the, on the fuel intake right now, so. So our third uh, one is uh, with uh, Tim uh, Staniszewski from uh, Multipoint Foundations. Uh, he, as I said, uh, Tim will be at the trade show tomorrow and he's going to do a couple of slides on raised raft foundations, which is the generic name for that type. Just... Thanks very much for having me. Uh, Tim Staniszewski, I, I'm, uh, I live in Ottawa. I've been with the Tridentic Multipoint uh, Foundations for two years. Uh, it's one of the most interesting foundation systems that I've seen. Uh, it's a 25-year-old system. It's been used up in in northern regions in Alaska, northern Canada, Nunavut, Norway, Russia. So typically we've been always building on a, uh, a permafrost. You can see the, uh, the slide where the, the house is elevated up on the, uh, the, the 3D truss. It's actually, a, it's called a space frame. 
So the multipoint foundation is like a, um, a three-dimensional truss. It's a very rigid, rigid structure. And what it does is it, it, it cradles the house and, and protects it against the moving of the earth. So what we're doing is we're actually sitting on top of the earth and we're letting the earth move. For the majority of time, we're trying to restrict how the earth moves into the house, uh, which, is, which is tough because trying to stop the earth from moving uh, is like trying to stop water from running. That the earth is going to move, it's going to heave, it's going to uh, freeze, it's going to thaw. Uh, what our system does is sit right on top of the, the, the soil. So we're not penetrating into the ground. Um, what's nice about this is you can actually put your 20 mil sheet down and build right on top. We're not going to punch down through the, uh, the, the, um, the foundation, uh, the, the, the soil. Uh, so it's a galvanized steel and aluminum 3D reinforced space frame. Uh, it provides uniform support. So the whole idea is that the whole house is cradled by our foundation system. So it's not going to rack, it's not going to move, it's not going to heave in one corner. The entire house is sitting on the entire foundation. So it's, a, it's almost like a, a cradle for the house. We retrofit 50% of our work is retrofit of existing uh, poor failed foundations. Uh, relocation of flooded areas. What's nice about our system is it typically starts at a three foot high frame but can go up to 10 feet high. So you can build in a, in a, in a flooded area. Now we can elevate that house out of a, a, a flood zone. Uh, and it's a lot of issues in, in the north now is, 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 uh, is flooding. So actually we build in some of the worst conditions in the world. We have frost. We have warm, we have flood, we have organics, we have clay, where, you know, if you look at the rest of the world, we're, we're one of the most uh, diverse. Uh, diverse environments that you guys are building in. Uh, minimal site prep. So we build right on native soil. So you're really not doing much excavation, if any at all. You can actually put your foam down, put your poly down, and, and do some granular and build right on top. Uh, gravel pad, timber pads are not required in most circumstances. So this is a, a, a quick shot of, of one of the, uh, the frames. This is actually a 25-year-old foundation uh, in Alaska that we built back in the early 80s. Uh, we went and looked at the foundation and, and said, well, it's, it's performing well. It's not a bad foundation. There was about a two-inch two slope over the, uh, over the 25 years. We went to look at other homes around this foundation after 25 years, and there were no homes because of the, the, the movement in the permafrost and the movement of the soil. Uh, all there was was just shells of homes falling in, roofs, walls. Uh, this was the only house standing in about an eight block radius uh, after 25 years. So the whole idea behind the, 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 the system is it, it lets the soil move below it. So you can see the center one. If the soil tries to heave and push up, uh, it's got to push up the entire foundation and the entire house. So what happens is the soil will fail around the base plate. It lets the soil move. It lets the, 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 the soil heave a bit then the load goes to the other lakes. I'm gonna be fast. You guys can come and see me at the show for, uh, for more information. I wanna let make sure that the other guys have a chance. Um, so this is a really good example of what it is. Part of the soil can be cantilevered, part of it can be resting, part can be uh, uh, eroded underneath, and part can be heaved. The entire frame raft sits on the soil and lets the soil move. Uh, come and see me at the booth. Uh, I'm in booth 16. Uh, my information is all there. I'm going to let these guys get up because it's... Perfect. Us. You work. Good Sorry. timing. Thanks. No, thank you, Tim. Oh, yeah, I appreciate okay. it. All right. yeah, we're all good. Um, I just wanted to show you um, uh, from Natural Resources Canada, they have this product and there are sample, or there's um, copies at your table. Um, they asked me to uh, present this. This was um, um, a, a, a design project from a couple of years ago. And this piece here is the... Um, container that held all of the building materials for that house in it. And so when they, are, when they empty it out, they actually use it as the utility room and the main, uh, the main entrance in the utility room attached to the house. So in places where they need to rapidly deploy homes and houses for people, uh, this was the idea that they came up with. And you can see it's using the same uh, uh, raised raft foundation. So I provided the uh, handout at your table. Again, there's extra copies here if this is of something of interest. Uh, Natural Resources Canada is interested in speaking to uh, communities uh, who might be uh, um, interested in this kind of a project. It's all SIPS panels, very, very uh, highly efficient. So at this time, I'd like to welcome up uh, Terry Sutherland, Brad Dobson, and uh, Lawrence uh, Thomas. Is that right? Sorry. And uh, they are going to speak about uh, um, 
the uh, Pile Foundations, which is a generic um, way of speaking uh, to the product that they are uh, discussing, which is Krinner Structural Screw System. I would like to make a point that I, by mistake, put um, the wrong email addresses in your handout. So if you are opening your handout and want to uh, reach Terry or Brad um, after this, that email address you have will work, but they would prefer people to use the um, nsscterry at gmail.com and nsscbrad at gmail.com. So my apologies, gentlemen. And this is who pushes it forward. Okay, thanks. Hello, everybody. Um, I guess we'll have to, we'll make this quick because I guess everybody's we must be getting hungry for lunch. Oh, yeah. Okay. Minutes, okay. Um, so what we're introducing to, to, uh, to you guys is a new product that we come across last year, and it's a screw pile foundation that... Uh, Keith, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> You're buzzing up here. <laughs> and the product was, is a Kerner screw foundation. It, it, it's brought to, uh, brought to Canada really in the past few years where it started to be used more and more, but for different applications. What we want to do is use it for applications for, for building houses because uh, where it works really great is in unstable ground conditions, because we don't we don't build near the surface. The the screw is is drilled down into a, a layer that's deep down below. That's a lot uh, harder. Load bearing, yeah. And that's just a typical uh, typical unit. The unit uh, the the system can be used for retrofits or new construction. And to the in the middle there, that's a, a picture of the screw and it's. The, the, the screw that we use for the, for the builds, it's a 16 foot long screw. Oh yeah. Yeah, so right there. And then that's the, just an adjustment post. So this is, is just a, a, a slide of how, how it would be done. There would be three, three beams installed into a, into a unit that you know, typically on, on, on our in the communities, we have houses that were built long ago with a, there's a sag in them, and they were built those the status quo houses from years ago. What we want to do is, is put in three permanent beams, and these are temporary beams that would be slid in place, and then slide the house back into the backyard, I guess, and then uh, install a Kerner screw system. And this is just a video of uh, how it's installed. No, that's not the video. This is just oh, I mean a picture. <laughs> this is a slide of uh, of the screws after they're installed, and it's a it's, it's a grid system. This is just the top of the screws that you you would see there now. So the, the video's video next. next. Video's next. Okay. So there's a this is a next is a video that we took of of the installation. Uh, what I want you to look at and listen to, actually, is is when we're drilling through the frost, you can hear the, the drill machine drilling, and it's, it's banging away, going through the frost. Then it's going to start spitting up soil. That, that soil is about four feet down, and it's very soft. That's what we normally build on. Towards the end of the video, you're going to hear the, the drill start banging again, and that's the layer that we're screwing the, the screw pile into. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. And I believe our uh, technicians, uh, you start it. Thank you. This is in Fort Albany, last winter. ice road and install the screws in the time when it's easy to access for that equipment as well as the products and materials for the job. This whole process took, I think, four days to put the screws in and have the beams on on day five. And this is for three duplexes, which is six homes. So it essentially... <laughs>
video was cut a bit short at the end there, but you can start to hear the drilling into the, into the hard layer. It's a hard layer of, of clay and sand. And then, uh, here's the, the final placement of the screw. So what it, what, what's happening there is it's a laser level that's used to, to get exact levelness for all the screws. These are just the last of the screws going in the ground. What we're trying to do here is, is stay out of the, the, of the water table. This is the insulation of the steel beams, which provided a very perfectly level surface to build on. So here the whole concept of what we're trying to do is 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 not dig into the ground where that where that high water table is in, in, in a lot of the communities and the unstable ground conditions. We're trying to get to a, a layer that's deeper down below. So, and this is just where uh, once once when for for retrofit that we can do where the um, the units would be slid back and, and the new unit, new units could be slid right right onto it with uh, if we go with a modular build. And that's just the slide of the the units slid back into place. So we built three duplexes in, in Fort Albany using this system uh, last winter. And, and we, we started in February, which is sort of the worst conditions that you can start in. And uh, once, it's, once the project was done and it's gone through the, the, the thaw free cycle, the, the units haven't moved. They haven't sunk or, or settled whatsoever. Um, the screws that we're, like I said, what we're trying to do is, is, is get into a layer of, of clay that's beneath the muskeg and beneath the unstable ground conditions. We want to get to that hard layer. And for this particular build, we used a, a SIP panel. Uh, 16 foot galvanized screws used, locks it, we locked itself into the layer. I'm nervous here because I'm not a public speaker. I'm a you want anybody else to take builder. it? Builder. <laughs> hey, you talk okay, yeah, yeah. I'm not a public speaker anyways, <laughs> but I, I will explain a little bit about the Karuna product. The screws that were used on this project were 16 feet, well actually uh, 4,700 millimeters. And they, they are designed and built in Germany, are designed in Germany and they're built here in Canada, in Chatham, Ontario. Um, kind of a central location to supply all of North America. The Kruner ground screw was initially started in the solar fields and took off because it lends itself to a temporary uh, structure, but it also has that permanent qualities and looking at the green product, it, it's 80% can be reused 30, 50 years down the road, 80 years down the road. As we all know, double dip galvanized below steel uh, holds up very well, or below ground holds up very well, but it also can be removed as easy as it is put in, so it doesn't impact the environment uh, and we keep We've used it in environmental areas as well as uh, underwater. It doesn't disturb silt. So if the environment is looking at it and saying it's a good green product, we, we're going to stand behind it as well. Uh, anything else? Uh, yes. The ground screw has been in use uh, throughout the world. It's a world company since uh, 1997 and around that time and very successful in the uh, sorry, solar industry, but it's also taking off in the municipalities and a lot of construction projects. We've worked at the Pan Am Games, and it solves a lot of problems for, for companies where no one else could do it. We've put radiation monitors in the, the nuclear plants, which was so difficult, but it had to be done, and we come in and were able to do that within a week, where other companies were saying, oh, months and months of digging and excavating concrete, uh, so the speed 
really speaks volumes as well as uh, it's green. There's a couple more slides there. Do we have some more slides? Yeah. I think Brad is your turn to sweat. <laughs> here we are on the next slide. Which button do I push? Right arrow. Right arrow. Okay, the exposed earth is covered with poly and a two inch fine uh, granular. That's uh, up for debate, um, mainly because of the, uh, the, the, the gravel in the crawl space. We talked about the crawl spaces earlier, going to a 20 mil poly, and then uh, for just for the quality of air, on the debate on whether or not to introduce the air from the crawl space up to the, uh, to the house air. One of the options are for the small CFM air fan to circulate the air in and out. Like that. And the crawl space is skirted with what we did in Fort Albany. We, did, uh, we used the SIP panels and uh, the plumbing is, on, is insulated and the main area has heat trace cables all the way to the curb stop. In conclusion, uh, crawl spaces can be designed to work, but it takes good design, good construction, good materials, good policy, and good education and training, <laughs> and good maintenance. Thank I think you that for doing my conclusion. <laughs> 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 Thank you, gentlemen. And, uh, we will be monitoring uh, these uh, three duplexes in Fort Albany. Um, as uh, they, uh, Brad just alluded to, the, uh, the granular material, um, not sure that that was a, a wise idea, but uh, we applaud their uh, efforts uh, to, uh, to do this construction. And to uh, Pascal Spence, who's the housing manager from Fort Albany, uh, good for you in Fort Albany for uh, um, having some vision and uh, trying something different. So kudos to you and uh, I look forward to and if I get the funding for this foundation uh, pilot, <clears throat> we will be monitoring that work and uh, we'll hopefully be installing some uh, raised raft uh, foundations as well. So I want to thank you all for uh, um, your attention. It was a long hour and a half and I appreciate your contributions to our uh, presentation and to our uh, guest speakers as well. And I'd like to thank you all for, uh, for coming and listening to what we had to say, and we hope there's some light. Uh, we're both going to be around for the next couple of days, so if anyone has any questions, we'd be more than willing or more than happy to sit down and chat with you about them and, uh, and talk about uh, what's going on, okay? Thank you very much, and uh, if appreciate you your time. If you're still looking for literature, I do have some extra copies up here if you missed something. <laughs>